All right, this week we're going to be talking about state and federal statutes. We talked about case law, and now we're going to talk about another form of primary law, statutes. And then next week we'll move on to the legislative process, which is basically how legislators create statutes. So as you know, the main focus in law school is cases and the U.S. common law system. And when you conduct legal research after you get into practice, though, you'll find that statutory law is at least as important as case law, if not more important. As a matter of fact, most appellate court decisions involve the application and interpretation of statutes rather than the consideration of common law principles. So even if you're a litigator, statutes are going to be important. Take a look at this. This is an actual street sign in New York City. Just a quick example of how pervasive statutes are in everyday life. This sign is actually a bit alarming to me if I'm being honest. I don't know how drone enforcement is supposed to work. Fortunately so far I haven't actually seen any drones enforcing anything, but I suppose it's just a matter of time. So as I said, despite the prevalence of case law in law school, statutory research is actually extremely important in practice. While not every research question is going to be answered by statutory research and not every legal issue has a statute on point, you're going to have to make sure that either you interpret and apply the relevant statute to your legal issue or you just determine that no statute applies to your issue. So either way, you're going to be doing statutory research. And again, as I pointed out earlier, the majority of appellate decisions involve either the application or the interpretation of a statute. So what are statutes? At the federal system, there are laws that are enacted by Congress, usually with the approval of the president, unless there's some kind of an override or something. And then federal statutes are published in three formats, first as slip laws, then as session laws, and then as codes. So it's the same thing put into a slightly different format and a different arrangement. And we'll talk about that in detail as we go along here. Okay, so just a really brief background of how statutes come into being. As you know from watching this Schoolhouse Rock video, all statutes and code sections start out as bills. Then when a statute is passed, it is published in three basic stages, and these three stages apply both to the print and the electronic form of a statute. So the first version of a newly enacted statute is the slip law, which is issued by itself as a single sheet or as a pamphlet. After slip laws, statutes are then published as session laws, and session laws are nothing more than the slip laws arranged in chronological order by date of passage, and then they're published in separate volumes for each legislative term. And then finally, the third form of statutory publication is the one that you're familiar with and what you'll be using most when you do statutory research, and that's the code. And all the code is is a collection of the statutes that are currently in force, and they're arranged by subject rather than by chronological order by the date that they're passed. So obviously they're much more useful if you're trying to do a statutory research on a particular topic. You can go into the topic and the subject arrangement rather than looking through all the session laws as they were passed and trying to find the topic that you're interested in. All right, so as I mentioned, federal legislative acts are first published as slip laws. Slip laws are issued separately in a pamphlet. This is obviously the print version, and they contain the text of a single legislative act and they're issued officially by the federal government. And in connection with the publication of a slip law, each new legislative act that's passed by Congress is designated as either a public or a private law. Public laws affect society as a whole, while private laws are passed for the specific benefit of one individual or a small group of individuals. An example of a private law would be a law to prevent the deportation of a specific individual in a political asylum case. And these kind of things do happen, these private laws. And how does the numbering scheme work? You've seen these and look on the slide, you can see public law and private law numbers, examples of that. So in general, each Congress lasts for two years and it's comprised of two sessions. Since 1934, the first session has convened on January 3rd, or the next weekday after January 3rd, of odd numbered years, while the second session has convened on January 3rd of the even numbered year. So that's how the sessions work and that's how the numbering scheme works as well. You can see on the slide that 116-1, that means the 116th Congress, session one. Here you can see an example of this on congress.gov with the law as it's passed. This is 116-1, which means it's the first slip law passed in the first session of the 116th Congress. And private law numbering works exactly the same way, but the designation is private rather than public law. We'll spend more time on congress.gov next week, but you can see here, you follow this tracker along, and you can see exactly where a particular piece of legislation is. And this piece of legislation goes all the way to the right. It actually has become law. And there it is. 
you can see what it looks like. Okay, so after slip laws, we move on to session laws. And session laws are the publication of both private and public laws that were enacted during a particular legislative session, and they're arranged in chronological order. So official session laws are published only after the session has ended, but commercial publishers often publish the advanced session laws so you can get the text of a new law sooner. In federal law and most states, section laws constitute the positive form of legislation. So what does that mean? That means that the session laws are authoritative, the binding text of law. Codes and other forms are only prima facie evidence of statutory text. So in the event that a dispute arises between the statute the code and the text in a session law, the session law will control because that's actually the version that was passed by Congress, whereas the code version is some organization is taking it and splitting it up into its various subjects. So if you're going into court and you're trying to prove what the text of a statute says, you go back to the session law. So an exception to this general rule occurs that the legislator has affirmatively chosen to enact an entire code into positive law, and that's something that we'll talk more about in a minute. There's the United States statute at large, so you can see, there you go, 109th Congress, second session, and then they're going to give the public laws from 1 all the way up to 1256 in that particular volume that I'm looking at there. And that's what it looks like. There's a public law as it would appear if you were looking in the session laws. So you can see it's got the public law number, it's got the table of contents, and then along the margin often it shows where that particular session law has been codified in the code. So you can follow along with the sessions and see where it ended up in the code. There's the citation that you would give if you were citing to the statutes at large. So it's 129th volume of the statutes at large, page 3. All right, let's just spend another minute talking about what is a code, because that's what you'll be using for the most part to do your statutory research when you're in practice. A code is the laws that are currently enforced in a jurisdiction arranged by subject. So in 1926, the United States Code was created. It's a subject codification of U.S. law currently in force. Back in 1926, it was arranged into 50 titles. And since the code did not get submitted to Congress, it never became a positive form of law. Instead, the statutes of large remain the positive form of law for federal legislation. And as I mentioned, that just means evidence of the law. So the code currently is comprised of 54 titles, and a complete new edition of the code is printed by the Government Printing Office, or GPO, every six years. And then there's five annual cumulative supplements printed in the intervening years. Codes can either be official, printed by the government, or unofficial, like the United States Code Annotated, which is published by West. And then a code can either be unannotated or annotated. Annotated codes are definitely a better place to start your research because they provide editorial enhancements, such as annotated notes to court decisions involving the statute, better indexing, finding tools such as a popular name table, and cross-references to secondary sources. So there's all these additional enhancements that you'll see in an annotated code. In addition, print annotated codes are updated more frequently than official government print codes. So if you're doing your research in print, you definitely want to go with an annotated code. And there's the United States Code in print. That is the official version put out by the government. And then here is some of the unofficial versions, as I mentioned, put out by commercial publishers. So while session laws contain the official text of legislative enactments, they are really limited in use for research tools. Researchers need the laws that are currently enforced rather than the laws as they were passed by a specific legislative term. They also need convenient access to amendments and related legislation, so that's why we have codes. As I mentioned, codes collect the current statutes of general and permanent application and they arrange them by subject. Codes are grouped into broad subject titles, and then within each title, they're divided into chapters and then numbered sections. Note that the sections of each legislative act or session law may be grouped together in the code, or they might be scattered across two or more section or even titles. So sometimes a single session law will get put into different titles. So they could be put under the Internal Revenue Code and the Health Law. It just depends on what the particular session law has to do with. So just keep in mind that that can happen. Codes are almost always where you want to turn when you're conducting legal research as only the code reflects the current state of the law, including amendments, repealed laws, etc. So imagine you're looking at a session law from 2010. There's no way to know whether that session law has been repealed, but if you're looking at the code, you will know because that will be reflected in the code. 
Also, as I mentioned, they're arranged by subject, so you can easily find the provision to answer your legal research question, whereas chronological order does nothing for you. There's the three big sources of federal law, the United States Code, the official version, and then the two unofficial annotated versions that are put out by commercial publishers, United States Code Annotated, you'll find that on Westlaw, and United States Code Service, that will be on Lexis. So, annotated codes, why are they better? They provide editorial enhancements. There's notes which are basically going to direct you to court decisions that have interpreted the statute. There's better indexing. There's tools such as popular name tables. So if you just know the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can go to the popular name table and it'll take you right to the statutory section. And then there's cross reference to secondary sources. So if you're looking at a statute, you're having a hard time figuring out what they're talking about or where it might be applied. The annotated code will refer you to an encyclopedia or it'll refer you to a treatise so you can read an expert opinion on that statute and get a better idea of what's going on. So what's the law? Is it the session law or is it the code? And as I said, the code only establishes prima facie evidence of the laws of the United States, except for these titles that have been enacted into positive law. The text of positive law titles is legal evidence of the law. So here it is in the United States Code where it's saying all of that. And then what does this mean, this positive law, and when Congress enacts an entire title into law? As I mentioned, if there's a conflict between the text, a non-positive law title of the U.S. Code and the text in the statute of large, the statute of large is going to prevail. If you want to see which laws have been enacted into positive law, you can go on to the Office of Law Revision Council website. That's the organization within the federal government that sort of splits the session laws up and puts them in the code. And here is their website. And there you can see which titles have been enacted into positive law. Those titles have an asterisk next to them. All right, just to kind of summarize here, what session laws get incorporated into the code? If they're general and permanent, so OCLR determines if a law is general, for example, classifying an act as a federal crime, or not, naming a post office. That's not general, so it's not going to get incorporated into the code. And then permanent. Permanent means that, for example, requiring an agency to make a yearly report or not. For example, making a one-time appropriation. So that's not going to get incorporated into the code. So what's some characteristics of session laws? The session laws are the law as it was passed by the legislature, order chronologically by year, no subject organization, no amendment, no general index, also no indication whether a whole entire session law has been repealed or not. And they're useful when you're doing historical research or if it's a provision of the U.S. Code that has not been enacted into positive law, it would be evidence of the law if you were in court. You'd have to go use the session law. Characteristics of codes are the law as it currently stands, reflecting all repeals, amendments, and other revisions. It's ordered by subject and not by year. Amendments to the session laws are integrated and a general index is available, so you can do subject-based research, and they are useful for most legal research. So what do you do when you're writing something? You're writing something to a court or you're writing a memo to a client. Do you cite to the session law or the code? You cite to the code for most legal research when you're discussing a general point of law. You would only cite to the session law if you were trying to establish the fact of an amendment, a repeal, or the actual enactment of the session law. And if you wanted to discuss a law that had not yet or would never be incorporated into the code for the reasons that we talked. It wasn't general, it wasn't permanent, so it's just always going to just be a session law. Where do we find code? We're all going to be doing statutory research at some point in our future. So in print, you go to the U.S. Code, the United States Code Annotated, or the United States Code Service. Electronically, you can go to Westlaw to get the USCA, and you go to Lexis to get the United States Code Service. You can also get the U.S. Code from GovInfo, the big federal government legal research portal, or the Office of Law Revision Council website. And both of them are great sources and free, completely up-to-date, authoritative, but of course they don't have any of those great annotations that I talked about that the USCA and the USCS have. Here we are in GovInfo. I can choose category and then bills and statutes. I can either take a look at congressional bills by bill number. I could look at the public and private laws by public and private law number. I could look at the statutes at large, or I could look at the U.S. Code. And here we are on the Office of Law Revision Council, and there is its version of the United States Code. All right, so just moving on, state statutes. Very similar to the process that we talked about at the federal level. They're a session law, and then they get incorporated by subject arrangement into a code. And many have official annotated codes as well as unofficial 
annotated code. So different states have different names for their codes. They could be like the consolidated laws, they could be revised statutes, they could be general statutes. Some states like New York have named the titles of their code. So in New York, we have the New York Penal Law, the New York Public Health Law, and then you should just if you're trying to cite it, you consult the blue book and see how each state code is organized so that you can cite to it. So in New York, we don't have an official code that's printed by New York State. Here's McKinney's, and this is the one that you'll usually see. This is an unofficial code, and it's published by Thomson Reuters, the same corporate family as West, and it represents the current state of the law with the revisions incorporated. It has a table of contents and a subject index. Lexis also prints an unofficial New York code, which is the New York Consolidated Law Service, or NYCLS. And then going down even a little bit further in the chain, there's municipal laws, and many municipalities have their own set of laws, which are referred to as ordinances or local laws. Like statutes, municipal law can have different names, could be an administrative code, could be regulations, could be city code, it just depends on where you are. So some of the municipal laws you can find online, for instance, in New York City, you can find on Lexis and Westlaw their administrative law and their code. Smaller jurisdictions may also be available on the web or in large law libraries in print or actually from their city offices. So here's where I live in Rockville Center and you can see we actually have our village code on the village website and there's all the different things. So now not only do I have to worry about federal law and New York state law, I have to worry about the village of Rockville Center code as well and what they have to say about what my dog is doing according to chapter 19. All right, so that's it for the video lecture. When we get into class, we'll do a short statutory research exercise to get us warmed up, and then I'll come back with another lecture, well, kind of more of a demonstration, really, of how do you find statutes on Westlaw and Lexis, how do you use the statutory finding tools that's provided by each of these platforms, and then how you use annotated codes in general to find additional relevant authority. We'll also see how you can make sure that any statute that you cite is still good law. Just like we did in cases, we need to do the same process when we cite statutory law, which is to make sure that it's not only been not repealed, but there's not some new statute coming down the pike that's going to change our answer in a couple months. We don't want to cite something in November that's not going to be good law in December. So after that, we're going to do a more complex statutory legal research exercise so that we can make sure that you all have a good handle on each of these techniques before we move on to legislative history and the legislative process, which we'll be covering in the next class. As usual, make sure you take the quiz before you go and submit your results, and I will see you in class.